My presentation is the result of the ambition of a silly man who, after having studied the inequality in Latin America and found some result, decided to look in three weeks to what happens uh, to inequality in uh, Africa. Uh, so when I saw this conference, I told Finn, oh, perhaps I should come and uh, present some of the results uh, for Latin America to see whether they make sense for Africa. And then he said, no, no, you just write the paper. So this is uh, the last three weeks of what I've done. Now, what will we be discussing? Well, I think that uh, the, the general tendency, I mean, well, let's say during the last, let's say 20 years ago, I remember uh, there was a huge debate on global inequality, a la Milanovic, I mean, among world citizens. Now, now there is much more attention to within country inequality, and that is also due to the fact that we do see that in some countries, the majority of the countries of Latin America and quite a number of countries in Southeast Asia, this inequality has improved massively. Now, the situation of uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, remains broadly unexplored. I mean, uh, we see it here. We, we can we keep hearing very, very different opinions. So what I try to do, and uh, you will, I mean, I have to apologize if the results are still very preliminary, we try to look at what happens to inequality in uh, Africa using Latin America as a benchmark. Not that Latin America is particularly similar to that, but in Latin America we have a very clear story. And so we are trying to see whether some of the factors which uh, have uh, been uh, <coughs> important in Latin America are relevant in Africa, and many are not, and what are the factors which would not be relevant in Latin America and are relevant to Africa. The, I can display the conclusions that I would say then 60-70% of the cases, Africa is its own drivers, inequality drivers. Now, one reason why I also looked into inequality in Africa is that I run by mistake into this paper by Salah Martin and Pinkowski, who argue that in Africa, inequality and poverty fell much faster than uh, what people believe. Now, so, and you know, this is a paper which has received quite a lot of attention, but, I mean, I think that uh, the, the paper is based on bad statistics. And uh, so uh, they re reconstruct data for some 48 countries, while in my case I am able to reconstruct it for 28 countries. Then they make all sorts of assumptions about the shape of the distribution, and then they come up with this, uh, with this shape. And then, of course, the story is that uh, since this happened in, from the 1990 onwards, it means that liberalization, globalization is good, this, which is also uh, questionable from a policy perspective. Now, this is what happens to Latin America. And in Latin America, these are well-measured data. In Latin America, we have what is called SEDLAC, which is a big project uh, financed by the World Bank and I think UNDP, in which uh, the University of La Plata standardized all the microsurveys going back for 20 years using the same way of uh, computing the data, uh, missing income imputations, grossing up, uh, and so on and so forth. So these are fairly reliable data. They are not perfect data, and they are not perfect what, what Andy says. Uh, so basically, the, as the efforts by Atkinson, uh, Saez, and Piketty and the others show, basically what, when we measure the income distribution, we measure the 90% percentage or 1995, and we don't really know what happens to top incomes. And that is also true in Latin America. Now, there are two or three of these uh, uh, assessments of uh, inequality based on tax returns, but basically we have one for, uh, not over time, we have one for Argentina in 2002, then we have one for Brazil and so on and so forth. So we have no time effect. The key point is that it's unlikely, I mean, uh, I will not tell you why, is that uh, the, even if I assume that uh, the, the rich have become richer and then, for instance, like the financial sector accumulated the greater share of national income in Latin America, it's unlikely that we'll have fundamentally altered this one. Now, Alvaredo has shown with a very nice paper that uh, uh, the corrected Gini can go one way and uh, the normal Gini can go the other. But for sure we know that uh, there has been a redistribution between the 1995 bottom part of the distribution. Now, <clears throat> now what, uh, can I reproduce this chart for Africa? No, and first of all, because it wouldn't come out like that. But basically because, first of all, there is no said luck. So, I mean, there's not a standardized database. So what we do, we started to go back to all the sources uh, of within country inequality, and these are with, which I'm proud to have created in WIDER. Now I'm also very happy to hear from Finn 
that uh, this is uh, a new data set will be released any time with 2,000 more Gini points. And then, of course, we went to the World Bank and we used PopCal, and then there is Milanovic WYD, which has more or less the same data plus something else. And now the World Bank has also uh, a set of, uh, I don't know, many 200 uh, consumption data, uh, consumption service, which they are standardizing, uh, like what they did in like. But standardization in this case requires so many assumptions that I'm not sure that they will solve the problem. The, the example they gave me is that in one survey in Burkina was a consumption survey. So they asked the families, uh, what do you consume of millet, goat, uh, or, um, vegetable oil, and uh, medicines, for instance. So only four consumption items were measured. In the subsequent survey, 300. So, so, I mean, if you want to standardize those, it would be very difficult. So this is the situation. We have a weak informational base. But so what we did is basically we compiled the data according to all these different compilations. And then we see if uh, there are sort of uh, common trends. They could all be wrong, perhaps. But um, we certainly uh, are comforted by the fact that uh, in several cases there are uh, uh, common trends emerging. Then there are some outliers, I mean, in some series, including from uh, the, the World Bank or WED, uh, in which uh, the, the time series, which is not a complete time series, but you have six or seven data, uh, the, the genie goes up by 20 points or goes down by 20 points, which is impossible. So we eliminated that. And then in the end, we retained 28 countries out of 90. But fortunately, these are the, the most important African countries. So, so we, this uh, captures 90, 95% of the population and GDP. Now, we do come up with uh, different trends, which are like that. Now, uh, I think that, uh, I, mean, I mean, when we did that, basically, I didn't do any particular statistical test. We just look at the scatter, and then we will do it, because I, mean, I started writing it. Now, so you have some countries where there is more or less, I mean, this is the average of this country, so there is variation. In them. So, so you have some countries, about eight, in which there seems to be a decline, then others where there is a decline, but then followed by an increase. Then there are other countries which are increasing all the time. And then others in which perhaps the increase is being uh, reversed during the last uh, few years. Now, the question is it, uh, now, let me repeat it again. Now, we will go back to this data and look at them even more carefully. We will try to, pro inshallah, the World Bank will give us the, the, the new data. Actually, they already sent them to me, but I was, they sent them to me one day before I left. So we will check against all possible sources, and then we have to say we have to try to make a story out of it. Now, when you have weak data, basically you have to rely more on economic theory. And on that, we do know a little bit more about Africa. So... Now, the method is the same one which, I mean, the way I'm proceeding is the same one which we use in, uh, for the Latin American study. So we, we do distinguish between what we call immediate or statistical causes. Normally, there are many case studies in which, uh, like Denis Cognot did a very nice study for five countries, in which you take two points in time and you do a sort of a statistical decomposition, which tells you that the, the genie went up or down because of changes in factors in there different types of income shares, and in their own concentration coefficients. So there are standard decomposition techniques, Lerman, Itzaki, Milanovic, and others. Uh, now, that tells you, uh, for instance, that uh, labor income went up. Is, uh, this is the, the source of the decline in Gini, but it doesn't tell you why. It doesn't tell you the, the causes of the, ph the phenomenon. So you have to look at what we call the underlying income factor. Now, you, you, when you look at the underlying factor, you cannot use the same decomposition technique because it applies to 40, 50 countries. And uh, <coughs> you have variables like macro variables which are not decomposable in the same way. So here what I'm trying to do is to summarize on the basis of the literature uh, what happens to the immediate determinants, so the statistics. Now, in Latin America, the key point in the analysis is the decline in skill premium. What, what drove the decline in inequality during the last uh, 10 years, more or less? And that is because there has been a massive increase in the supply of skilled labor, which reflected big efforts in the educational area. Did we find that uh, same? Is it, is it equally important in Africa? No. If you look at it, we'll see some data on education. And then is it the skill premium important? Perhaps in the urban sector, like uh, Cogno, for instance, this is what he finds also for some of his paper. Uh, but not, not generally. 
Then, so these are all the reasons. So there's been a stable demand for skilled workers, rising demand for unskilled, and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> now in uh, Latin America, as the fall in the urban-rural income gap being a central point, a key factor in explaining the climate quality? No, except in two or three Central American countries, which are much more agricultural. So, so here we already start seeing that the paradigm for explaining it is that in one region is basically the supply demand, relative supply and demand of skilled labor, and in the other one is uh, the, the, the size and the trend in the rural-urban income gap. Now the question is, on what does it depend, this uh, urban-rural income gap? Well, first of all, I mean, luck. I mean, there's increases in world agricultural prices. And not only for copper and oil and so on and so forth. If you look at the, the, the price of maize, this is double. You know? So now, of course, most of the maize produced in Africa is eaten in Africa, but there is a, a modest transmission of world prices on domestic prices, which may produce an incentive. Second, I mean, the exchange rate policy, and I think that, uh, as uh, I think Andy and other people have mentioned before, basically now there are more reasonable macroeconomic policies. I mean, there is not that is... Uh, Overly, develop, overly, value, overly appreciated exchange rate. Now, thirdly, in, uh, uh, in part of Africa, and this, I think, is one of the good parts of the story, there is a little bit of a maize green revolution, and perhaps there are others which I've not been able to capture. But one of my students has just done a thesis on the green maize revolution in Eastern Africa, which shows, and I will show some chart, that uh, there's a... And then liberalization of agricultural markets. So, basically, these factors, they, they are central to the analysis of the decline of the urban-rural income inequality, urban-rural income gap in, in Africa. Now, in Latin America, there has been, uh, here we have Armando, Armando Barrientos, who wrote the chapter in our book. And basically, I think that uh, there is a long debate, but I mean, it's, it's quite certain that uh, the, the, the Bolsa Scola and all these type of transfers, I mean, uh, they, they are, they've been important. And Paj de Barros, who is... Uh, the Brazilian economist basically argues that uh, 2.5 Gini points were explained by the Bolsa Scola and various types of transfer. Now, these transfers are basically uh, budget finance. I mean, they are pay paid by the government. Now, in, in, uh, in Africa, except for the Southern African pension systems, basically uh, the transfer system uh, it does not operate like that. Remittances. In Latin America, remittances turned out to be surprisingly equalizing against the theory. Now, in Africa, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been able to find uh, evidence in this regard as yet. Now, what are the underlying determinants? I mean, then, I mean, you, say, you start saying, well, both you know, for the first column is Latin America and the other one is, well, <clears throat> in terms of trade, I mean, I think that the data show, and then even in regression analysis, we do find that, that uh, the terms of trade gains for the oil and metal sector basically are highly inequalizing. The production function, yesterday Arne was talking about production function. I mean, the production function in that sector is very capital and skilled labor intensive. So if, you, if the oil prices go up, there will be some Spanish engineer who will make more money, but not, not, not many unskilled local workers. The foreign direct investment, which in Africa they go mostly to this, and in Latin America as well, they, mo they go, mostly go to the primary sector. They are equally unequalizing. The market emittances we don't know. And then foreign aid. Foreign aid is uh, irrelevant in, uh, in uh, Latin America and highly relevant uh, in... Uh, and then here there is a chart. Where is it? Oh, I, I lost it. No. Okay, uh, there, there is a table. I mean, basically in Latin America, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, the, the low-income countries, they receive a shock of about six points of GDP per year. And that, if it is properly used, this is a very, very important to, to correct here on this. Now, exogenous changes, man. dependency rates, man. in Africa there are no changes in dependency rate because birth rates have not fallen. Cell phone revolution, uh, is, we don't know how to measure it as yet, so perhaps it's relevant, and it's what uh, Radele says. Now, there is a decline in HBI hates. I mean, there is, now no, no, I don't see any more papers, but uh, I wrote a book on the economic impact of HIV AIDS in Africa, and basically, here what we say, this is the prevalence rate in Southern Africa, and you see that there is a decline, but a very, very tiny one. So it is unlikely that the improvements on the aid front, they have uh, uh, reduced the rated degree of impoverishment of poor families. So that is unlikely. And uh, 
conflicts. Conflicts in Latin America are irrelevant. Here they are, they do are relevant, and then we measure them with uh, dummy variables. Now, then, then you have uh, the growth pattern, and I think that uh, in uh, Latin America it is slightly equalizing, the top one. And now, this are, is all countries com confounded and without control, so you can, cannot really say much. But this is the second one, the bottom one is the one for Africa, so basically it's totally neutral. So growth here appears not to reduce income inequality. So, <clears throat> and what on the other side uh, we, we see is that this type of growth is a growth where the resource countries, when there is a massive primarization of the economy. So the countries which are, yes, thank you, the, the countries which are uh, uh, with a high share of uh, natural resources and GDP between 90, 2000 and 2010, you know, on average now resources account for 42% of GDP. And these are, uh, these are resources which uh, they are oil and metals and, and Muslim oil and metals. So we see that for about 18 countries, uh, or, uh, the natural resources have increased quite, quite a lot and that, that tends to be unequalizing. Now, policy measures. Now, both countries, I uh, think that they follow similar policy. They have more reasonable macroeconomic policy. With one difference, is that in, Latin America, in, uh, in Africa, the, the, the reduction of the debt has basically largely been driven by the big initiative. So we were very, I was very skeptical myself. But actually, in the end, you do see that this is uh, delivered. Now, the, the other uh, trade policy, I mean, in, uh, in Latin America it turns out that trade policy is unequalizing during the first period and then neutral in the second. So unequalizing 80, 90 and, uh, non, and neutral in the second. In, in Africa, I don't know yet. I mean, as I think that uh, that is a major point. Now, if I listen to the African debate, many people complain about uh, China displacing everything. Taxation. Now, taxation, actually, uh, uh, amazingly, Africa has increased taxation. So the whole idea that the state capacity, state capacity can be improved. And if you look at the central bar, I mean, central column, I mean, in seven or six or seven countries, the main source of taxation are direct taxes. Now, <clears throat> educational policy, this is a major point. I mean, you see, this is the ratio of skilled workers with secondary and tertiary to the other one. So, and here is the proportion of rural population. And it's a little bit like what Eric uh, in another way showed before. So basically, there is no increase in secular and tertiary education in countries with very high rural, uh, rurality. And the question is, it, is the government who is doing a terrible job, or is it the fact that uh, families in a backward agricultural society do not want to send children to school? Now, this is the yields, uh, maize yields, uh, hectograms per hectare. And actually, you do see these are Malawi and Zambia. And actually, you do see that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some now, the political factors, I mean, in Latin America, in our uh, analysis, we do also pay attention to both, number one, whether the country is democratic or not, and second, it turns out that the proportion of left-wing regime uh, tends, I mean, left-wing means Brazil, uh, Uruguay, social democratic, or more radical methods. Now, here is, uh, now the scale corrects it, but I mean, it's quite striking that the period in which uh, inequality fell in Latin America, well, I'm almost done, the, uh, in, uh, basically shows a very sharp rise on the left, uh, center, center left regime and a very sharp decline in the right wing regime. Now, in, the, in Africa, we don't, we don't have a coding of the country by the polit political regimes, but do we have sort of this uh, 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 trends about democracy, anocracy, and autocracy? And you see that there is some, uh, some improvements, but not really much of that. Now, I think this is the, there are, uh, now, so some of this data we try to, I mean, this is very preliminary, okay, but then, first of all, we find that GDP per capita growth tends to be equalizing if you multiply, if you interact it with uh, the agricultural production index, which means if growth takes place in agriculture, then, then you will have lower poverty and lower inequality. Now, the share of work with tertiary turns out to be not significant, but if you take the share of work with, uh, without education, it tends to be unequalizing. Then the external debt, for some reason, doesn't turn out to be significant. The taxation turns out to be highly significant. Turn, turns of trade, if there are interactive variable mineral rich, turns out to be highly unequalizing. 
remittances tend to be slightly uh, 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 equalizing. Aid on GDP doesn't turn out to be nothing for the moment. And FDI, foreign direct investments, is, as in Latin America, highly equalizing because it goes to the uh, resource sector. And then that conflicts is an equalizing and the quality of public administration is also equalizing. <coughs> now, I conclude. I mean, I think that... Uh, on, on based on this highly preliminary work, I mean, what can we say in terms of uh, reducing inequality in Africa? Well, I think that uh, <coughs> there is a massive need to reduce the uh, rural-urban income gap. And the nice chart that Eric showed that, I mean, there is a decline in the share of agricultural work without increasing GDP. That, that is a, so, a sort of worry. And then what you want to see is that a non-decline of the share, but with an increase in income in rural areas. So we don't want to use the Lewis model, but the Rani's fame model, you know. So why, how does it happen? I mean, these are the, all these factors, the revolution, liberalization of the sector, and so on and so forth. Then the second thing is, which I didn't mention so far, is that now there are something like 5% of the land in Africa has been taken over by land grabs. And now, in part, and, and there is a nice chart which shows that this happens not in countries like, I don't know, Central African Republic, but in countries with, with fairly, le fairly low landman ratios. So the land grabs do not occur, as one would expect, in land-abundant countries, but they occur everywhere, and perhaps even more in these countries. Now, I think that the, the, the other lesson is that uh, there must be efforts for intensifying education. Yes, I'm just, I'm, let me just finish this one. Now, then uh, efforts in tax collection and some transfer. Now, the final point that uh, was also mentioned in the prior section is democratization. And, uh, and uh, if I listen to most of the African debate, is that avoid the reprimarization. I think in Ghana, in Accra, in December, there is this uh, initiative on... Uh, Africa inequality, and I think it's very much based on uh, avoiding uh, being uh, brought back to the colonial division of labor. Thank you.